Welcome back to America's Talking. I'm Austin Berg. Today, we're joined by Dr. Thomas S. Kidd. He's a research professor of church history at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's a senior fellow at Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. Dr. Kidd is joining us today uh, on the heels of the release of his new book, Thomas Jefferson, Biography of Flesh and Spirit. Dr. Kidd, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. What is the most important lesson on ethics you learned from your study of Jefferson? Well, I think that that I, I learned much more about the disjunction between many of Jefferson's stated beliefs and and the way that he actually lived. And so, I suppose the the lesson there is is that, especially with someone like Jefferson, who is so intellectually sophisticated uh, and and has you know a cultivated uh, philosophy that there is only so much that that tells you about the way that someone actually uh, lived. And I, and, I, and I don't think that it's probably an acute problem with Jefferson because we know uh, Americans you know, tend at least to know about the Declaration of Independence uh, and at least the implicit ethical philosophy there. Um, but it, it's a, I, I'm sure it's a problem of anyone who has Sort of, sort of a cultivated systemic uh, philosophical system that that doesn't necessarily tell you everything that you need to know about the way that this person actually lived. Mm. So obviously the ethical quandary that comes to mind with Jefferson, probably for most people first is slavery. So I think maybe his first, I'm, by the way, I'm going to say a bunch of Jefferson things that I think are true throughout this interview. And you're going to check me if, if any of them are wrong. <laughs> okay. I believe one of Jefferson's first acts as a member of the legislature in Virginia, if not his first act, was to introduce a bill to abolish slavery in the state of Virginia, right? Yet, of course, his his relationship with slavery was very complex. Could Could you talk to us about this? Yeah, I mean, it, there's there's definitely some confusion about what he actually introduced and and when and and what he he planned to do. But um, Jefferson in the 1780s is is pretty clear, uh, and this is fairly early in his political career that uh, that slavery is immoral, uh, and that I mean, it, he says in notes on the state of Virginia, which is the only full length book he ever published, that. Uh, he even thinks that slavery may elicit the judgment of God on America. It's it's so bad, uh, which is kind of a strange thing for Jefferson to say in the context of the rest of his career and religious beliefs. But but um, he, he's clear that slavery is immoral, uh, that it's bad for whites and blacks. Um, obviously, for the people enslaved, it's bad, and and uh, and so the, he from early on has this idea that um, if political sentiment would allow for it in America and in Virginia that uh, some kind of program of gradual emancipation would be uh, the way to go. Um, but Jefferson is also convinced that if you if you free the slaves, that you, you just simply have to get the freed slaves out of the state and, and out of uh, the, the country. Um, and that if you have some kind of rash program of emancipation that happens all at once, that it's likely going to lead to a genocidal race war between uh, whites and blacks and the, the you know, white owners and the former slaves. And so he he basically set such a high standard of, of what kind of political conditions that you would need to have emancipation that he really does ends up doing very little about uh, emancipation him, himself either politically or uh, personally. Now, as, as president, it is true that he, he uh, signs off on the, the ban on future uh, slave imports into the United States, and that, that is a pretty significant move. Uh, but that, that's also uh, about all that he uh, really actually does with regard to limiting slavery in America or in Virginia. I believe, again, this is an, an Austin Jefferson fact that I need to get approval on from you, that the man promised his wife on her deathbed that he would not again marry. How did that promise affect the rest of his life and what ethical dilemmas did this raise? Yes, we, we think that that is almost certainly true, that something like that conversation happened with his, his wife who died uh, very early um, in, in their marriage and, and again in the 1780s. Um, and so Jefferson is, is left as a, as 
a fairly young man, uh, maybe early forties. Um, and, uh, he, he has promised not to marry. Um, but he, he has ready access to, uh, female slaves, most obviously Sally Hemings. Um, and she, she comes to live with him, um, in Paris when Jefferson is an American diplomat in Paris in the later 1780s. And, uh, you know, most of what we know about his relationship with Sally Hemings is, it is inferential and based on, uh, uh oral testimony of, of, for instance, uh, their, their children. Um, but, uh, we, we think that his relationship with Sally Hemings starts in, in, in Paris. Um, and that, uh, she, they're, She's about 30 years younger than him, so she's in her teens and he's in his 40s. Um, but he he has sort of ready access to her, uh, and she's she's most of the time uh, as an adult is is a household slave who who lives in close proximity to him. And so, um, he, one of their children, we we, we believe it's it, that, and he says that he's Thomas Jefferson's child. Um, sa- says that. His mother, Sally Hemings, became Jefferson's concubine, um, and other people talk about her as a, quote, substitute for a wife. Um, and, and so we, we think that they, they had some sort of arrangement that is, of course, in the context of the, the coercive nature of slavery, um, where they had a longstanding uh, sexual relationship. I wouldn't want to characterize anything about the emotional intimacy at all, because we, we just simply don't know anything about that. And, and we have to remember that she's at the end of the day is his uh, slave. But but uh, that that relationship seems to go on for decades uh, after uh, Martha Jefferson died in the 1780s. How did Jefferson's ethical or moral framework in what elements was it most divergent from what you would have expected from someone like him at that time? Or was it mostly in line with other folks of sort of his stature and, and standing? The fact that he's a slave owner, of course, makes him just a totally conventional uh, elite uh, landowning Virginian. Um, and so uh, even though slavery is is deeply immoral, uh, I, I don't think he is an exceptional figure. That it, it's, it's a little more rare, though, though not unusual, for slave masters to have sexual relationships with uh, female slaves. Um, uh, but we, we think that Sally Hemings uh, uh, is, is uh, the, the child of a, a, a slave owner and a, an enslaved woman. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we, we actually think that Sally Hemings and Martha Jefferson have the same father. Uh, so it, it is, it, even in uh, Jefferson's own family, it's not unheard of to, to mm. have the, these kind of uh, relationships. So that would make Sally Hemings uh, Martha Jefferson's half-sister. Um, and, uh, and Sally Hemings uh, reportedly um, is very light-skinned. And, and uh, actually, in the 1830 census in Virginia, is registered as a white person. Um, this is after Jefferson's death. So, so uh, that that is state strikes modern observers as uh odd to put it nicely but but um it's it's not that unusual um one of the things that i learned about in the in the research for the book though uh it, is that there's also a huge gap i think in between jefferson's uh touting of the value of frugality and financial independence and the way that he actually lived financially um to put it uh, simply, he was a financial disaster. Um, and uh, it, again, it was not unusual for people to be in debt at the time who were plantation masters. The the system sort of like, you know, buying a house in America today. I mean, you just assume you're going to incur a substantial amount of debt to, to do that. And that's kind of the way that business worked for plantation owners. Uh, but Jefferson takes it uh, to... Uh, unusual heights uh, uh, or depths of, of debt in, in his case, uh, because, mainly because he, he was not a very effective uh, business farm manager. Um, and he also uh, had a very hard time controlling his spending on uh, things like wine 
in in uh, books. Uh, now, I, I I have to say I approve of overspending on books, but but uh, uh, he what just to give one example, um, one it, at least one year when he was president, his expenses. Now, in those days, the president had to pay his household staff out of out of pocket. And his, and at least one year, his expenses just on wine were more than what he paid his household staff uh, in, in total. <laughs> so he was spending phenomenal amounts on on wine and and all kinds of European products and so forth. Um, and and he just never seemed to be able to get that under control. Uh, but when you look at, you know, if, if you look at social media today, uh, some of the most common Jefferson quotes are about controlling your spending, mm-hmm. which is. Uh, is is kind of ludicrous in some ways because Jefferson is is the perfect example of not doing that. That's really interesting because I was curious when, as you were saying that, I was thinking about Ben Franklin and his autobiography being, you know, a, a massive bestseller at the time and this sort of self mythologizing of some of these folks. Mm-hmm. To what extent did Jefferson really engage in things of that sort? Franklin clearly had a vision of, you know, I'm I, almost uh, creating an American identity and in, in a kind of celebrity, I guess, in a sense. Whereas Jefferson, you know, this is my my biased view of him, but I just think of him going to drink in France. You know, and, and that's that's what I think of when I think of, of him. But how did he market or, or how did the public view him throughout his time versus what he was actually engaged in? Well, I think in any public figure then or now, you know, there's a certain kind of managing either consciously or unconsciously of your of your public reputation. And um, and, and in Jefferson's case, I think, especially his historic legacy, uh, he actually told when they were both old men, he, t- he told James Madison, take care of me when I'm gone. Uh, and which and what he was saying was, you know, I, I'm going to even after I die, assuming that Jefferson dies before Madison, which he does, um, I'm going to need you to kind of watch out for m- my legacy and memory after after I'm gone. Um, and, and Jefferson was, uh, I think, obsessively conscious of that. I mean, he he did view himself and he was correct. He, he viewed himself as a, as a person of world historical significance. Um in, in, in contrast, for instance, to Patrick Henry, uh, the Liberty or Death speech guy, uh, I, I wrote a biography of him too. He saved almost Henry saved almost none of his personal papers. I just don't think he thought he was that important. Uh, so he didn't even save the text of the Liberty or Death speech, uh, which is an awfully important wow. speech. <laughs> so, uh, you so but you mean how how do you, how would you know that Jefferson thought of himself as this important historical figure? Is it simply the preservation of records, or did he? Sp- and and I guess this this remark to Madison does that manifest itself in other ways or just well he, he, you can't tell by the fact that he saved everything he ever wrote I mean and, mm-hmm. and you know thousands and thousands of pages of, of documents he he did things like and and Franklin did this too um, he he wrote drafts of his own epitaph um, mm-hmm. you know thinking very much about his legacy that way and and it's often noted that his and and, and what he wrote did end up on his tombstone that uh, he, he noted that he was the author of the Declaration of Independence, the Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom in Virginia, uh, and founder of the University of Virginia, not mentioning that he was president of the United States. And, and that, that's a very stylized. And I think it is reflective of, of what Jefferson thought was really important about its legacy. But to be thinking in terms of writing your own epitaph, um, it, it's speaks to that kind of consciousness of your own uh, legacy. Now, now Jefferson never wrote anything like uh, anywhere close to as popular as Franklin's autobiography, but he did. I mean, he he worked on making sure that the Declaration, for instance, was seen as this critical founding document. Now, I mean, the Declaration doesn't have any kind of controlling legal authority in America. It's just a statement of, about independence, not like the mm-hmm. Constitution. Uh, but Jefferson worked very hard. I mean, John Adams thought July 2nd should be Independence Day because that's when they actually voted to uh, declare independence from Britain. But Jefferson, no, no, it has to be July 4th because that's when we adopted the Declaration of Independence. Um, and so you can see him there kind of managing the history of the revolution so that he would be highlighted. That's very interesting. Why? So I'd never heard that bit about his epitaph. So why do you think those three items override 
his presidency in his mind in terms of his legacy? Well, I, I mean, I think it's it's clever in some ways because it's not as if people are going to forget that he was president. <laughs> so I, I, th- I think it, it, it does project a certain humility um, that, that is in, cor- in accord with his political philosophy. I mean, I don't think that Jefferson considered the national government to be all that important. And that, so I think, I think Jefferson may have actually thought that the office of the presidency was ideally should not be that important of an office. But it's also that Jefferson is preeminently a man of the Enlightenment, uh, and and so he he focuses on the the, the Declaration because it, it portrays him as this founding figure of par excellence. But but also uh, his contributions to religious liberty, which is uh, you know very much an Enlightenment priority, and then and then uh, UVA with you know his contributions to education. So I, I think he is is portraying himself as sort of America's founding intellectual um, mm-hmm. and philosoph, and and I mean that it worked. I mean I I think that's very much how he's seen today. Could you speak about uh, perhaps his decision making framework as a leader? So for example, you know we talked about for, he loved France. Um, Adams hated the the French, maybe. Uh, Jefferson generally positive things say about the French Revolution, right? Adams like this is too bloody. This is these people are crazy. Um, but Jefferson's stance was neutrality, right? And he took political heat for that when there was conflict between the British and the French, and America didn't trade with either of them. And there was tremendous economic consequences of that too. Um, it, maybe it's through that decision, maybe through others. Could you talk a bit about sort of his framework for making those large decisions? Uh, he, he definitely allowed uh, his political ideology to, to drive his decision making, and sometimes that that went well. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the greatest success easily of his presidency is the Louisiana Purchase, um, which is a, a, a deal that sort of fell into his lap uh, through partly through diplomatic or- overtures to the French government. Um, and but it also uh, Jefferson definitely saw America as a republic of small farmers, and so if you have the opportunity to double the size of the country in one fell swoop, uh, that that it, it you know it, it made much more room. Of course, presumably presumably it involved taking Native Americans to land, but but uh, it made much more more room for the small time American farmer. Um, but uh, in the case of the uh, the embargo in at the end of his presidency, uh, where you know to to stay out of war, he he cuts off all American trade with Europe. <laughs> it, it was absolutely cataclysmically disastrous for the country, uh, and and so I think you know it, he's a very he, he doesn't always have his principles all sorted out about what the implications are. But he's definitely making decisions based on principle as he as he sees it. Uh, but sometimes the practical results of that could not it could turn out not so great. What do you think his the biggest misconception about his legacy is in modern America? Well, I mean, I think it, it's it, you know it's so contested what his legacy. Is I mean I, I I think we just don't, simply don't know what to do with Jefferson anymore um, in, in our era of cancel culture. Um, you know it, he here's this titanically brilliant person, uh, and even though I, I, as you can tell I have I'm somewhat ambivalent about, about Jefferson and his legacy, but but I mean there's no question that he is he is an intellect of absolute first rank in in American and world political history. Um, and, and so he, he has, you know, great value to, to, to him in, in his writings, obviously with the declaration, uh, but, but on many other issues as well. Um, but we, we sort of don't know what to, what to do with people like Jefferson now. And not only was he a, he a slave owner, but, uh, he, he was in, in this relationship with Sally Hemings and and I think could be a cruel slave master at at times, um, and and his hypocrisy on those matters uh, is, is made all the more conspicuous because of his authorship of the Declaration. 
Um, and so I, I think that it, it's, you know, it's not so much misconceptions, but just perplexity that we have about about what what do we do with people like this now? And I, I think in our historical moment, that's sort of our, our greatest challenge is is how do we be candid about the, the, the failings and sins of people like Jefferson, while not also, you know, just trying to sort of trumpet our own virtue because we're denouncing people like Jefferson and 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 leaving behind the, the the value in his thought and legacy. I mean that 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 was you know the approach of someone like certainly Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, who who found himself able to appropriate Jefferson's legacy in in spite of the fact that I mean I think King was anti-slavery, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean it, you know somehow we can do this, but mm-hmm. but uh, uh, in in our social media driven culture, we seem to have forgotten how to, to value people who were imperfect, which, you know, seems to me is most everybody who's ever lived. So we talked about freedom of religion. We talked about, um, declaration of independence, university of Virginia, um, Louisiana purchase. What do you think are some other top contributions of his life? say in the realm of, you know, unique contributions to American p- political thought or enlightenment political thought? I, I think for me, uh, and, and I say this partly as a Baptist, I mean, that that his contributions to religious liberty are right at the top of the list and, and in a way unsullied by the, you know, the problems of the hypocrisy over slavery, for instance. Um it's a wonderful, I think, conjunction with Jefferson that he uh, does derive his beliefs about religious liberty substantially from the Enlightenment and from people like John Locke. Uh, but he he is partnering in the fight for religious liberty with lots and lots of evangelical Christians. Um, it, it's a it's an alliance that seems kind of improbable in in retrospect that you have this kind of Enlightenment philosoph and. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a sort of deist, uh, you know, comes a kind of Unitarian Christian by the end of his life, but, but he's, you know, definitely does not have traditional Christian beliefs, but, but both he and these evangelicals, especially Baptists, uh, believe that the government should just get out of the business of promoting one religion over another, especially one denomination over another. And he, he also, uh, I think was sympathetic towards groups like groups like the Baptists because they had endured so much persecution from uh, the the colonial and then and then the American state governments for basically being kind of weird types of Christians, um, and, and and so it created this partnership between Jefferson and Madison on one hand uh, as as more Enlightenment sort of defenders of religious liberty. Um, and evangelicals who were sort of the, you know, the shock troops on the ground uh, who were dealing with actual persecution and, and so forth. And it's so, you know, it created this kind of evangelical and deist alliance for religious liberty that I, I think it's really encouraging because, it, you know, you just you tend to think that religion uh, is something that only divides people politically. Uh, which is usually the case today uh, in, in in America, but but at the time of the founding, I don't think it had to be like that. Um, and even though Jefferson, I think, thought the Baptists were sort of crazy, um, he he was happy to defend their religious liberty because he thought that it was philosophically the right thing to do. Thomas S. Kidd, Doctor Thomas S. Kidd, the author of Thomas Jefferson: A Biography of Flesh and Spirit. Thanks so much for joining us, and thanks for talking. Thanks for having me. 